Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Keith, Keith Bebe. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Pennington Institute. I'm a workforce development officer. Uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about uh, substance use in workplace and the OHNS considerations. So it is a discussion that I expect, uh, we expect people to, to be able to put in questions if they have questions that they would like to ask. Uh, some of the questions I'll try and answer them as we go along, or we can uh, revisit all the questions at the end of the discussion. So if I, if I can tell you a bit more about Pennington Institute. So we are focused at, on uh, community safety. When we say community safety, we're talking about building up programs, supporting programs that, they reduce, that reduce burden of disease and dependency. Um, we also put in the human dignity at the center of, uh, of, of, of our interventions through educating of communities like we're doing now and also putting into practice the best available evidence via research, which we run our own research programs and also working on research from other uh, organizations. Um, we also include the voices of the, uh, of the people who've got the lived experience. And when you say the voice of the people with lived experience, we're talking about the families of those who've been affected by drugs and also the people who have also used drugs in the past or are currently using drugs. This is, um, the aim is to, at the center of all this is to build a better response to drug use. And when we say drug use, we're talking of both um, licit and illicit, as we will go into detail. So we're going to be focusing mainly on, not on all the drugs, but the emerging drugs that are, that we think, that, that, that we're, we're getting reports that they're causing um, challenges to society and to workplaces as well. So the first part, um, <clears throat> if we look at um, substance use in Australia, it, drugs are readily accessible in Australia. Uh, the main ones that we know, alcohol, tobacco, and we classify these under um, licit substances. So they're not illegal. They are readily available in the shop. You just have to be over 18 to purchase these drugs. Then there's the illicit substances, which is the most used one is cannabis, heroin, ice, which we call ice or methamphetamine. And also we need to remember that uh, the pharmaceutical misuse and the prescribed medication is causing a major problem in our society. We should also mention that alcohol remains the biggest um, drug that is used and the most, uh, causing a lot of most of the accidents uh, in society. So drugs are classified, or firstly we say illicit and illicit, but we also classify drugs according to their psychoactive uh, effect on the central nervous system. So they are classified into the main three uh, categories. So the first one being uh, the stimulants. Um, the, the stimulants, other stimulants, we've got the methamphetamine, which we, the main one that we refer to is ice, and in there we've got cocaine as well. Then we've got the dep depressants, which um, alcohol is the main one, we also got opiates, we got cannabis, and we got the benzos. The benzos are uh, usually people know them as one of the main ones is Valium. And you've got the hallucinogens, um, which in this we call magic mushroom and the LSD. But some drugs do fall into two, two or more categories. So you've got the one like MDMA and ecstasy. Sometimes they fall into the stimulants category and also the hallucinogens. So there are risks associated with um, drug use. So not everyone who uses drug is going to be um, dependent, and not everyone who uses drug is going to be addicted, and not everyone who uses drugs is going to be violent. But however, there are risks associated with drug and alcohol use. The main ones which we're going to cover are uh, blood and blood-borne viruses, which we cover include um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. And HIV, if left untreated, will, um, can lead to AIDS. Then we've got the risk of overdose, and we've got the risk of sexual behaviors. So as you go through, you realize that some of the drugs, because of their effects on the central nervous system, they can cause someone to, some people to become, uh, to take on se risky sexual behaviors. 
There's also the infections, the infections that can be picked up from how people use drugs. So some people do inject drugs, and in the process of injecting drugs, or the drugs, what is contained in the drugs, can cause infection, or the way they inject can cause infection. Then there's the substance abuse, and substance abuse leads to dependency and dependence and addiction. There's the well-documented mental health problems that we, that we hear about. Then there's also crimes and uh, crime and offending. So not everyone who uses drugs can afford drugs. So people sometimes have to resort to other means of, of finding income to, to then buy those drugs. So in workplaces, there is the underachievement in relation to the personal and professional goals. There is the well-documented absenteeism from work and the OHS issues that we're going to go uh, that we're going to go into detail about. So the first drug that we're going to look into is uh, methamphetamine. And most of you, you would have heard about methamphetamine as uh, ice. So ice. ICE is, 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 is readily available in, in Australia. Uh, we will look into the history of how ICE got to be where it is today. In, not in great detail, but we'll just give you a, 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 a brief overview. So ICE is usually av available in, in three forms. So the methamphetamine is available in three forms. So the first part, which is being the powder, which can sometimes be made into tablets. Then you've got the base, which is uh, like a paste. It's brown in color and oily. Then the powder as well, which we've mentioned. Um, then they also got the, the glass part of it, which is the purer form of it. And the purer form of, the, of this methamphetamine is what is referred to as ice. So what is, what is new about ice? It's not new. Methamphetamines are not new in the world. Methamphetamines have been around for a very long time. As back as, back as 1980s, sorry, um, it is reported that around the 1919 was the first methamphetamine developed um, uh, from Japan. Some reports say German. But it became readily available for medicine in the 1930s. Then in the student time of the Second World War, pilots were reported to be using these to be able to fly long distances. And then it was then made into medication, which was readily available in, um, on prescription. So it was this from the prescription that then in the 70s, people started diverting that and making it into personal use, and it then became illegal. To be, uh, to, be, to be purchased or to be prescribed unless under very strict conditions. So by early 2000, America was having its first problems with, um, with ice. And in Australia, then this started around um, 2010. So when we say methamphetamine is not new, what has changed? So the glassy part of ice that we looked at earlier on, which, um, which I'll go back to, which is the what the picture on the bottom there is the pure form, and the purity of that is said to be about between 60 to 90 percent pure. So the, when the drug is that pure, it means that there is increased use. It becomes more addictive. The potent is quite, is quite important, and then people use it quite frequently. And um, the other thing that has changed is that it's now manufactured locally um, within our communities. So as a result, that shipping distance or the, the distance that was, that was causing the price to go up has been um, eliminated, making it very cheaper and accessible. So as we said, because of its pure form and because of its way of use, um, it's, it's the, the, the increase in weekly or daily users. Um, some people report to use needing it at least three or four times a day. Again, it starts very slowly, as you will see. And with increased use, it comes increased harm. And also, it depends on how people use it. Uh, smoking is the most popular way of using ice. And once you, when you smoke in the drug, it gets into the bloodstream quite quickly, making the effect very, very effective. And quite, people talk of a very um, high euphoria feeling. So. <clears throat> As we will see, the, um, methamphetamine does affect quite a lot um, of our, almost every part of our body in a way. But I'm going to concentrate on the main, main parts, which is the psychological part. 
and the, also the some of the organs, the main organs that we come across in, in you know, that we get reports about is is the, the cardiac side of things. Um, blood pressure goes up, your heart rate heart rate is quite rapid, um, and the people who have reported have uh, had heart attacks from the high heart heart rate. And also, there is also the high blood pressure causing damages to the brain vessels, uh, leading to strokes and cl uh, uh, clotting and, and, and then stroke. There is also the kidney function, which I would like to touch on briefly. So people will report going on um, what are called binges. So people go on a binge for a few days, and as you can see from, from that diagram, methamphetamine is a it does oppress the appetite. And so people can go for a few, few days without a proper meal. And then post use as we will see, there's what is called the crash. So combining that um, binge plus a crash, people can go for a while without, with very minimal food or fluid, and then that leads to quite severe kidney damages. So that's one of the main physical things that I would like to talk about. Then there's the psychological side that we've seen there is insomnia, there is aggressive behavior. But I should mention on the side of aggression behavior, contrary to some of the reports that we read, not everyone who uses methamphetamine is going to be aggressive. Some people do become aggressive, and we'll look into that at a later stage. There is the paranoia, which is quite, quite, quite clear. People become very, um, they become very paranoid about the surroundings and those who are around them. There is a decreased appetite, as I mentioned earlier. People become quite alert, alerted, and there is confusion, hallucination, and some people become very quite obsessive in their behavior, and the panic, panic attacks as well. So what leads to all these problems? There are three main chemicals that we're going to look into. Obviously, there are quite more chemicals that are, that, that are involved where methamphetamine is involved. But the three main ones that we would like to look at is um, the first one being um, the dopamine. So the dopamine, which we naturally, our body naturally produces this uh, when we do certain activities, which I will look at. Um, it, it's involved in us being alert and being motivated, and it also works with our, um, our memory. So the dopamine works in the mid brain part of uh, the mid part of the brain, which is the limbic system, where the reward part of, 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 of when we do things. So when someone uses drugs then like methamphetamine, that is really, uh, the volume of dopamine is increased, um, leading to the body needing to recompensate or to refigure how what to do with so much dopamine, which is then what can, when people go, go into problems. There is the noradrenaline, which is, um, which is involved in our, our level of concentration or our fright and flight part of things. So it's basically the adrenaline kicks in and you become very attentive. And so it works on the attention side of things, also makes on the recall memory. And, um, but once this runs into problem, we'll see what then happens. There is also the serotonin, serotonin which is involved in our satisfaction of things, the relaxation and the sleeping pattern, which then causes insomnia when this is out of control. So we will look into, into more detail about this. So as I say, do, uh, dopamine is the main chemical that is um, involved when methamphetamine is, um, is used. So those are the levels that we get. So if you look at the first part of that graph, it shows that um, when you have a meal, a good meal that is, when you have a good meal, dopamine levels are increased to a certain level. Uh, you get into sexual encounter, there is a level of dopamine. Then there are also other drugs like nicotine or cocaine. But then if you look at the level of methamphetamine, so that's about 1,200 1, more than the other drugs or the other activities that are involved. So that's a lot of um, dopamine all at once in the brain. So this is what then leads to further problems. So first of all, if we look at that, not everyone who, not everyone who uses methamphetamine is going to go into problems. So studies indicate that there are people who are described as occasional users. And these are people who might be using methamphetamine less than once a month. And so their route of use is usually swallowing or snorting. 
And there are people who are working in normal jobs like you and me, uh, they don't have many problems in this situation. And their form of intervention at this stage is usually just the harm reduction which we look at and just to prevent that riskier behavior. But then there's also the second group of people which, um, which are then described um, as the, the, the regular users. These are people who are beginning or are already in problems and they are using the drug at least more than once a month or even more. So as we said, some people will then end up going into daily or weekly and even multiple times a day. So these are people who can be described as dependent. They've got other problems. They've got usually have um, other physical health problems or mental health problems or mental health issues, as we should say. And their main form of use is smoking or injecting. So remember, the form of use is going to affect how quickly someone gets dependent. So if someone is smoking and then injecting, the effect is quite quickly because it's going straight into the bloodstream compared to someone with soda. So they're able to control, their, they're not able to control the level of use. They become dependent very quickly. And the other problems that they will have is the insomnia part of things, nutrition issues, as we said, and the risk activities. So in this situation, the person really is in very risky situations, and that's when we we'll then start getting into problems. So these are the, they are a very small group of people, but because of the level of use, they are likely to, um, they are likely to be having major problems, and they are the people that we are likely to see. In the, in the news headlines saying um, these are the people causing more of the problem. But they're very small, but because of the level of the problems that they have, they are likely to seem as if they're quite a lot. The next graph that I would like us to look at is, um, so we talked about the 30, the 70% the and the 30%. So the 70% that we're looking at, there are a lot of them. But if we look at the, that this graph, on the average, this is a study which was done by, um, from Lee, um, who is quite a, a good professor in, this, in the subject of um, methamphetamine. So if we look at, um, on an average, the persons using methamphetamine starting at the age of about 17. So the first use, remember that first use of the 70 percent, there is no problem. But then they, began, they begin to become a regular use at the age of average age of 19.9. It is this stage that I would like us to concentrate on, this 19.9 to 20.7. So 19.9, they are becoming a regular user. Then the 20.6, they're beginning to have their first problems. So the first problems could be probably mental health, some of those things that we talked about, um, the paranoia side of things. But then things move very quickly between 20.6 to 20.7. That's a first period of, 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 that's a period of about a month when someone is starting to have proper symptoms of mental illness or mental health problems. So things change very quickly between the 30 and the 70 percent. So we talked about the brain changes. So if we look at that, the level of dopamine that is being released into the brainstream compared to the average day-to-day -day levels of dopamine, it's quite high. So this is likely to cause changes. So the brain will see, send signals to say we've got too much dopamine in the, in the system, so we need to slow down. So then that leads to depletion of the dopamine levels. And then, so meaning that the person is going to need more of the drug to, to achieve the level of uh, stimulation that they got the previous time. So again, because the drug is so, so pure, means that there are strong cravings. Um, the changes to the brain, remember those three chemicals that we looked at, um, they, once those are affected, the dopamine, the, the noradrenaline, the serotonin, that is going to affect quite a number of things. So we're looking at the level of motivation. Motivation is going to be quite variable. So in terms of work, when someone is, um, you'll find that the person is, is not performing to their level that you're used to. And, or the person might still go and use and then come back. So you'll find that there is a, a, quite an up and a down, up and a down, 
meaning that the person is really having problems. There is the impaired ability to manage emotions. So the emotions can be quite outbursts, um, which we'll look into how to address those. There is also the impaired thinking processes, so the level of memory and the processing of, that the person is usually capable of becomes quite impaired. So there is a high risk of relapse, obviously, if you're going to be having all these strong cravings, you will feel that I'd rather use rather than deal with the cravings. The long recovery and withdrawal time, so some people are taught, say, to be in withdrawal for quite a long time, so there's what is called prolonged withdrawal. So there is the usual withdrawal that we deal with in the day-to-day -day life of alcohol and other drugs. Methamphetamine, unfortunately, is very, very different when it comes to withdrawals. Withdrawal, withdrawal can be quite prolonged, and there are some people who are reported to go for up to 18 months before they can fully, fully recover. So the long recovery associated with this is, is very important to remember. So there's the mental health problems that we've looked into. Um, the main ones being uh, depression and anxiety, but some people become, they, they actually end up with a mental illness diagnosed, which then needs hospitalization. So the psychological impact that we uh, that will, that, that are very very common, and these will affect how we work with these individuals. So if someone is recovering or someone is opened up that they're using or they've become into problems, so we talk of the memory being impaired quite severely and the ability to plan things. So getting to appointments becomes even a major task. Or so getting to work becomes a major issue. So if we look at the comp completing of tasks, if you do assign someone a job, if you're a supervisor, you find that they're able to focus on that task is quite a challenge as well. Um, because of the frontal part of the frontal lobe part of the brain that is in, that is that may be affected by the by the drugs, they, some of them may struggle with um, taking on a new information. So the ability to learn becomes a challenge. Um, there is also the part of um, decision making, which is very important in that if someone is unable to think of um, in their decision making process and they're unable to think probably about the consequences of their behavior, if we look at uh, some of the people who actually become impulsive. So impulsivity and inability to think of consequences then means that this person is likely to engage in very risky behavior, risky behaviors to themselves and to others. Um, the goal setting or working towards goals, which again is related to planning, is quite impaired as well. Uh, some people are unable to, uh, to stop that inappropriate behavior. So inappropriate behaviors could be things along the sexual side of things or the way they, they, they work around with others. So there is that impulsivity. There is also um, the switching from one topic to another. They are very flex the flexible thinking is impaired to a great deal. There is the unexpected outburst that we've already mentioned, which uh, that combined with impulsivity can be quite a challenge for others to deal with. So that, that that's the part that I would like us to to to, to leave the, this, the side of methamphetamine on. So, but then remember we're going to talk about also other emerging drugs, which um, the next drug that we'd like to look at is the opiates. So this, the area of opiates is quite, um, it's quite different from methamphetamine in that opiates are downers, so they, 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 they're depressants. But, and also when we talk of opiates, we're talking of both licit and illicit. So when we say licit, we're talking of someone who has been prescribed medication. So then there's the illicit side of things that we mainly, when we talk of opiates, we're talking of heroin. Or actually the prescribed medication has been diverted and this ends up being sold or misused or used uh, uh, not as per the instructions of the prescriber. So this is where things get into, it become difficult. So the pharmaceutical misuse in Australia is on the rise. It's, on the, you know, it's, it's increasing quite rapidly in America at a very alarming rate to the extent that there is so many things that need to be, have to, to be done. And we are beginning to see some of these problems in Australia. 
So, for example, between 2010 and 2013, um, there has an, there's been an increase of um, from 4.2 to 4.7 of misuse. So, unfortunately, this data might be a bit behind. The data for 2016 actually indicates very worrying figures as we look into more detail. So, again, between by 2000, 2013, almost 5% of Australians have reported that they had used uh, or misused um, pharmaceutical drug uh, for non-medical purposes. So people are prescribed the medication, or either they either steal the medication or they prescribe the medication and they mis end up misusing it. So some people are prescribed medication for really genuine reasons, so as painkillers and analgesia, where um, someone has had an operation and from there they become um, dependent on the drug and then dependence leads to addiction. So when we talk of opioid uh, uh, abuse and the risk of overdose is the main problem. There is also this the psychological and the, the physical side of things. But with opiates we've got a major, major problem which is drug overdose. And drug overdoses are fatal. So some people do die from these drug overdoses, and some people have what is called near misses. And it's those between those two, the, the thin, it's a very thin line between surviving and dying from a drug overdose. The, contrary to what we sometimes believe as, as people, lay people, we believe we sometimes mislead ourselves thinking that drug overdoses are mainly affecting young people. Research indicates that most people that are affected by drugs in Australia are between the age of 40 and 49. So they have had the largest group of drug overdose. So drug overdose, um, they've nearly doubled between 2004 to 2014. If we look at those numbers from 342 in 2004 to, uh, from 174 in 2004 to 342 in in 2014. That's a huge, huge climb. But that number is actually rising much faster between the last two years or last three years. There are other groups that are more affected than, uh, than others. As we know, the, 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 the gap between non-Aboriginal communities and, and the Aboriginal communities in most healthcare um, problems, the issue of drug overdoses among um, Aboriginal people is quite significant, and this has increased as well between 2004 to two, and 2014 to almost double 9.4 per 100,000 in 2014 when it was just 3.9 per 100,000 people. That's a huge number of people looking at the, if we're looking at the number of Aboriginal people in Australia. So again, as we say, the non-Aboriginal communities are affected, but not as much. So about 3.3 compared to um, compared to 3.9 and 4.8. So that they are increasing, but not at the same rate. So like um, methamphetamine, um, opiates do affect quite a lot of part of our bodies. But again, I would like to just pick a few parts of the physical side of things that I would like to talk about. Um, when I say physical side, I'm talking about the cardiovascular side of the effects of, the adverse effects of, um, of opiates. So if we look at the heart rate and the, the heart and the respiratory side of things, so the, the, the respiratory side of things is, and obviously the brain, is, are the main two, the main three organs that are associated with, with the drug overdose. So, once, some, once someone takes an opiate, there is, is the chemicals that are released in the body, obviously the euphoric side of things, but then the signals that are sent between the, the, the respiratory side and the brain, so then the, that leads to the slowed breathing. It is this slowed breathing that leads to overdoses. So we'll look more into detail about that. So it's, it, there are a number of things that um, that are associated with this, obviously the level of drug that you've taken and also how much drug you've taken in the past. So we'll look at those who are more at risk, risk than others. Again, the, is the psychological side of things and also from a working point of view where, the, where we're talking of OHNS considerations, there is um, 
there are very clear instructions when you someone has prescribed these opiates that you need to consult with your doctor if you have been operating machinery and things like that. So you and you can't drive while it's some taking some of these um, or, or some of these um, medication. So it is very important to think about this um, if you're going if you've been prescribed and also to just open up about it before you cause um, yourself accidents. So the main thing that I would like us to look at is the fainting and the dizziness. So that's very, very important if you're going to be working with machinery or working in, in very busy environments. There is also the psychological side of the hallucinations, the loss of appetite, um, the drowsiness and headaches and mood changes. But the main message that I would like us to focus on is the overdose. Overdoses are on the increase mainly from the prescribed medication and also the part of the OHNS as well. So the overdose, there are risk factors that are associated with these. Um, and how we can address some of these risk factors is very, it, it, it's, first of all, it's about talking to your GP before you are prescribed, or if that is if you're using the prescribed medication. But also bearing in mind that when you mix drugs, the risks of overdose is increased. So mixing of opioids and alcohol, for example, opioids and benzos, is a huge problem and it's associated with double the risk. So avoid using more than one drug or reducing the amount that is, that, 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 that is available. So changes to tolerance levels. This is a big problem that we, I would like to touch on in more detail. So when we say changes to tolerance levels, here what we're talking about is that you could, um, for example, if you were using um, heroin from a certain dealer or you have been, you've stopped using, you were in hospital and you, have, you stopped taking the opioids and suddenly you think that I need to reuse those drugs. The tolerance level has changed. So within a very short period of time of stopping to use any opioids, the, the level of tolerance changes. So, but then the risk then comes when you then use thinking that I was using this amount, let me use that same amount. It is this part that leads to, that is associated with high levels of overdosing. So using, using a higher than usual amount of purity, so this again means it can be associated with a change of, of, of where you buy your, 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 your heroin. If, some, if someone's using heroin and they suddenly using a pure form of heroin, or if they are buying the, the prescribed medication from someone else, then some of the medication is stronger than others. So be aware of this, and sometimes people talk of uh, trying a tester shot, which is a way of um, using a very small amount and seeing the effect. And also the way that the drug is administered. So for example, if you're going to be um, injecting. Once you inject the drug into your body, it's in your body. Whereas compared to smoking, um, you can smoke and stop, smoke and stop. Then that gives you a chance to, to see how you're feeling. So those with existing health problems are also at high risk compared to those who are not. So continue on the same note. So the other risk factor is using alone. So you're using alone and there is no chance of someone getting help on your behalf once, you, once you're in that overdose. So injecting with others might be a good idea or controlling of the injecting process. What this means is that it, some people prefer someone to inject them on their behalf or preparing the drugs for them. This is quite risky in that you, you do not know what they've put in there and you you don't know how much is going to be injected into you. So you being in control of the injecting process yourself is actually a safer way because you are measuring compared to with what you've used in the past. So injecting um, in, that, in drugs as well, it, again, it's a, it's a high risk, it's, it's a high risk process itself. But it can also be associated with infections as we mentioned earlier on. So one can, um, change routes of use. So what, 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 we talk, what we mean by this is that you can swallow or snort. Also, you can also 
alternate um, the sides where you, so if someone is for example is injecting and they are right handed the chances are that they're going to be injecting into their left hand quite a lot and vice versa so if you train yourself to to switch hands what, what that means is that it gives your veins a chance to heal on the other side and then that way you've got less chances of your veins collapsing or picking up infection the other huge assumptions that um, people make is that People assume that pharmaceutical opiates are less risky. This is not the case. Um, there are people that are very good at manufacturing some of these and they put them in the labels and they call them, the, and then they sell them as prescribed medication. So pharmaceutical opiates are also very risky and they are just as risky as because you are using them not, not under the instructions as by the prescriber. So again, as we say, those who've had a history or near misses of overdoses, they are, the high, they are quite high risk of overdosing. So be aware of all these risks. So we touched earlier on on the, some of the, um, the psychological side of um, effects of, of, of opiates. So there is the cognitive, what you can call cognitive effects of, of, of opiates. There's the drowsiness which again is very, very important, especially in workplaces and also if you're going to be taking prescribed medication, this is quite risky in, work, in the working environment. There's the decreased ability to perform tasks, um, there's falls and the difficulties in self-care. Um, the level of attention is also affected, so due to the psychomotor speed being affected, the working memory may also be impaired in some, in some, in some of these cases. So, continue on the part of um, overdose. The overdoses can be managed. They can be managed um, in a number of ways. First of all, what I would like to say is we've highlighted that the overdoses are a medical emergency and one should always call triple zero and follow the instruction and the advice of the operator. However, there is also a medication that is available. So this medication is called naloxone. It is an injection, it comes in injection form at present, and those who have been trained can um, inject someone with this medication. And if you do know how to use it and you've not been trained, it is better than nothing, and it should be, it is advised to to, to, to go ahead and administer and you will not be charged for doing so. And it's got no effect to the body, it does not cause any adverse effect um, on, 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 on the person who has been injected if they have not taken opiates. So like any other drug, it needs to be, um, it, it's got the process of where it is obtained. Naloxone, uh, the government has recognized this risk of overdoses and recently they have changed um, the scheduling. So what we mean by scheduling is how the drug is available in Australia. So the drug, you can, you can obtain it in two forms, either getting a prescription from your GP or you can walk into the pharmacy, into the pharmacy, into the, into the pharmacy and with um, guidelines and education from the pharmacist, then you, they can sell it to you without a prescription. So how does naloxone work? So naloxone works by reversing the effect of heroin or an opiate or pharmaceutical opiates such as morphine, oxycodone, and fentanyl. So it, it displaces the opiates on the opiate receptors. However, this is a very um, temporary measure in that hence we emphasize that you should call an ambulance. So it gives the it provides that window of time between the ambulance arriving and you waiting for the ambulance to, to you, you're trying to assist the person. Remember also that when you're working in an environment where you are um, working with people who, who are new to Australia, who might be new to Australia, remember just remind them of triple zero and there's also the, the protocol around your work area and your policy regarding how to deal with medical emergencies. So how do you recognize um, someone who is had an overdose? 
um, their body is quite limpy and floppy, both arms and legs. There is a heavy knot that comes right in front of the person. Their head is quite straight down. It's like a, a nod and snoring and gargling of sounds from the throat. And very infrequent breathing or sometimes irregular or no breathing at all. If the person is of um, white skin, they, their skin can be quite pale, clammy skin, blue finger uh, blue lips and blue and, and, and fingertips as well. However, if the person is of darker skin, the skin can be quite clammy as well and turns into kind of like a grayish color. So there is also possible um, vomiting. There is unconscious and unresponsive to stimuli. So when you shout and calling them their name and they're not responsive. If unresponsive, obviously, then begin the overdose action. We do have um, an, a, a, a chart that we that we've put together, but we can try and um, and talk about it at a later stage. But it, there is a process that can be, that can be followed. So the second part that, um, that, that the third part that we'd like to talk about post um, overdose is a new drug that is coming in and it's been around for a long time. But we are getting reports that this is um, getting into very um, risky and people are using it more. The reports that we're getting um, about the steroids mainly. So this drug, the steroids fall into um, what is professionally called performance and image enhancing drugs. So in short, they're called PEDS. So they can be steroids or they can also be um, sun tanning products, which come in so many different forms. So the, the purpose of these drugs, why people use these drugs is that people use them, um, to, as it says, to perform, to, to, to increase their performance or to, to change their image, to enhance their image. So some people might want to look muscular and beefed up. Um, some people might want to do more working out. Um, we should say that steroids are illegal in Australia. They are sold on the black market. And there is no guarantee that, what, that what you, the product that you're buying. So some of the steroids that are available in Australia, they're actually meant for veterinary use. So they're not meant for humans. They are actually used in the vet, by vets. So because of the, the hidden side of this area, the, uh, there is a lot of the unknowns. And there is also, with a lot of unknown, there is also the unknown side effects of all this. So the unknown numbers of this largely hidden population among people who who use performance and image enhancing drugs is, is, is growing. So they are mainly injected and these people access our services via the needle syringe programs to obtain free injecting equipment and um, we, we support this um, on the grounds that these people, if they are not supported, they will be even more hidden and they'll end up sharing needles, which comes again with major risks of um, HIV, hepatitis C and B. So there are studies that have been done on this subject and um, the performance uh, in, in image enhancing drugs come with major risks. Some of them, we have divided the, the risks in this study, they have divided these risks into, into two. So the physical side of the of, 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 of the of the adverse effects. Um, liver disease is quite huge. Um, for men, there is the gynecomastia, uh, which is um, uh, basically means men boobs. Um, the heart heart valve disease, hair loss, cancer. Um, there is the sexual dysfunction. There is the headaches, the prostate problems, diabetes, and gum disease. And the psychological side of things, um, having come from mental health area myself, there is huge uh, issues regarding aggression, um, especially where the, when there is um, drug uh, steroid-induced psychosis. Because some of these guys are quite huge and become aggressive, and they become quite aggressive. And also using a gym quite a lot sometimes. There's the general psychological health concerns 
there are also relationship problems, there's the body image issues, and depression is quite, it's quite common, especially um, post um, what is called um, post cycles. So what is, they, people use these drugs in cycles. So at the end of the cycle, people report quite um, a lot of depression. So this then causes the person to stop the cycle and reuse. So instead of having a break, as they normally recommend in this area, people end up not having breaks at all in their use. So meaning that you're putting a lot of pressure on the organs of the body and then leading to dependence as well. So this is a, a quotation that we got from one of um, the people that were involved in a study. And this person described the psychological effects being similar to, to those of drugs. They become part of your routine and habit of life. It creates a sort of a dependency. This is more scary because gym becomes dominant part of your life. It affects what you eat. It affects when you sleep, going out. You can get quite neurotic about it. So this is a statement from someone who was using um, the steroid. And it is also that reported that people become very unrealistic. They actually end up with very unrealistic expectations because there's always someone who is going to be bigger than you. So you're always trying to chase that to be the biggest guy in the gym and which can then lead to problems. So the, the next part which um, I briefly touched on um, a needle syringe program. But what we what we have here is what is called harm reduction measures. So harm reduction measures are practical strategies that have been put in place to to stabilize or to give that some to allow someone more time to manage or repair their life. So for opiates, there is what is called opiates maintenance therapy, and sometimes it's called opiate replacement therapy. So this what this means is that the person who is taking uh, either the prescribed medication or the medication or the drug that they're buying of opioid form is then put on a prescribed dose that is monitored by a GP and dispensed in a way that is that reduces harm. So for example methadone and buprenorphine sometimes called Subutex it is prescribed once a day. So this means that this allows the person not to to be chasing after drugs once it's dispensed, they have it in the morning, and it can last through the day. However, there are barriers to this kind of um, this assistance that can be so effective to people who are living in, a, in an addiction life. So to stabilize their life, um, it comes at a cost, unfortunately. There is what is called the dispensing cost, and this can require a lot for someone who is not working. Um, there's also the attitude that we get from some of the people that can be prescribing. Some GPs are not so keen on prescribing this medication. But research does indicate that when someone is struggling to, to manage their opiates misuse, going on this medication as a harm reduction measure is a very effective way. So I did briefly touch on the new syringe program. So this is where um, people encourage we encourage people a healthy practice is among those who inject drugs. Why do we do that? Because it reduces transmission of HIV and hepatitis. It also decreases the financial burden on the health system. Um, NSPs, as they are called, they are very successful public health investment. So if you can imagine preventing someone from getting hepatitis C, and HIV, the cost of treating someone with hepatitis medication is quite high. The cost of treating someone with HIV is very, very high. So if someone can use clean needles or drug, clean drug equipment, then this makes a huge difference. It also reduces infections in their bodies as well, and that can be quite significant. Some people have ended up having to have amputations due to the level of infection in their bodies from using um, contaminated needles. So how do we support people who are struggling with substance use? As we have mentioned already, harm reduction strategies are one part of that. But however, when you're at work and someone is, um, is, is, is reporting that they are struggling or you think a friend that you're working with is struggling, 
talking to your friends about it if you are if you are struggling talking to your family and talking to others about it and if you are a person of, of, of supervising someone who comes to you listening to them and just listening out for some of those clues that they might not be able to say that exactly that I'm struggling with drugs but listening out for those clues to say that um, some people might actually say I need help without actually using the words I need help so asking those questions and also by being polite about it ask them about their drug use if they've approached you in a way that you you think is is not stereotyping them so assessing for their readiness for to ask for help so again saying I do you think you are ready to seek assistance and then according to your organization protocol you can point them in the right direction so there is a lot about um, the attitude that we that we as people who might be assisting someone who's got a drug problem or someone who is struggling with drugs so being non-judgmental in our approach being kind and being approachable as well so treating everyone with respect drug users are individuals too and there is no stereotypical person who uses drugs they all come from from all walks of life so being mindful of this especially the non-judgmental part that can be a difference between someone talking or seeking help um, but if they're struggling so there are some triggers that can cause people's behavior as we talked about um, the first part of when someone is using um, some of these drugs so it can lead to challenging behaviors when someone is affected by drugs and these may include simple things as lights being very bright being the environment being noisy and waiting for long hours or, or slow moving queues or delays for appointments so these come under the OHNS legislation and can be addressed using the, the organization um, guidelines on the OHNS and one way of doing that is training um, training staff can equip them with the skills to to address some of these behaviors so how do you respond when someone is presenting with challenging behavior again management plan so a organization at an organizational level or at a team level there can be a, what is called an, a management plan um, assessment of safety of risks so in in the environment that you're working training alerting staff of risk that may they may encounter so for example if you're working in a bar so you, you might have a clear management plan on how to respond to these situations a safety plan so this can be about the working environment layout knowing the escape routes the duress alarms and other offices nearby that can be a summon for assistance So these are some of the things that we can we can look into to say how do you talk to someone who is struggling? So speaking clearly to them in a calm and confident manner, listening in a non-judgmental and in a respectful manner, and being mindful of your body language as well. That can mean a lot to someone. And accepting that some of their perceptions as unrealistic as they might appear to be, they are real to them. They are real to this individual. So remember that some people may be hallucinating, but to them, they, what they're talking about is real to them. So avoiding um, negativity or excess stimuli. I think that brings us to the end of our of our discussion. Um, so we at Pennington Institute, uh, we we recognize um, the impact of, of of drugs and the overdose risks. We've got some resources that are online. Um, I would have loved to have talked more, a bit more about, in detail about some of the um, the issues, such as the how to address um, overdoses, which can be quite cru crucial. Buying your time and being the first person to be there and addressing that overdose can can be a lot to you. It can mean a, a difference to the individual who is lying on the floor. But again. We've come to the end. Look at our website to see what you can find, especially on the Overdose, uh, um, Overdose Awareness Day. There's also the COP program that is on there, and you might find some information that is really good to guide you through. Thank you very much.
I don't know if we've got time. We've got time for questions. Um, I don't know if we've got any questions um, that have come up. Hello? Uh, Keith, there was one question for you from Nick, and he was asking whether the 70% and 30% of, of the data that you quoted is Australian user data. Yes, it is. It is a study that was done by um, Associate Professor Nicole Lee. And we can actually even break that down. So on the 30%, the 30% it can even be broken down into further, into 1515. And there's a 15 that can be quite functioning still, but then there's also the other 15 that are really in dire situation that involves probably even requiring medic, uh, admission to hospital or admission to, to, to be managed in safer ways. Does that answer the question? Hello? I think it might, Keith. Um, look, the only other questions we've got here, I don't know if anyone has any other questions they have for Keith. If you do, please enter them into the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen and we can address them now. Um, yeah. Some of the questions coming through, people are asking whether we'll have notes um, or, or copies of the slides distributed and we will actually distribute a copy of the recording from this webinar yeah. and also a copy of the slides to all the participants after today's session. Um, okay. If there are any other questions, we might leave it there, Keith. If there are any other questions that do come through, we'll email them through to, to Keith. There is one from, uh, from Paul D who says uh, cannabis use. Um, I can briefly just answer that. Um, cannabis is, is an interesting area as well in that it is the second used um, drug in Australia after alcohol. And cannabis is taking a very different turn at the moment in that um, people are resorting to what is called synthetic cannabis. And I don't know whether this should actually be called synthetic cannabis because tests that are being done are finding that um, some of it does not have cannabis at all in it, but it's being sold as legal highs. It's, it's got so many names. So the, the part of the question of cannabis use is, is quite, is quite a, a wide area. And the, it also seems to be driven by people are using um, this part of drugs because they believe that it cannot be tested in workplaces, it cannot be detected in their workplaces. Uh, Keith, we've got another question here and it's from Andrew. Do you think media coverage helps or hinders usage rates in Australia? So media, sorry, can you repeat the question please? Do you think that media coverage helps or hinders usage rates in Australia? So media um, can be good, it can be bad. And the side of, um, there are some very good things that are coming out of the media at times, but there are also some things that are not helping. So when I say not helping, I'm talking about, uh, so for example, the, the image that is portrayed that everyone who uses methamphetamine is dangerous and is going to be bashing people around, it does not actually help because it, when someone is, is used the drug, they, they then feel that they are going to be labeled as someone who, who bashes people. And also the media sometimes might not report other things such as alcohol. As I said, alcohol remains the biggest problem in Australia and in quite a number of parts of the world. But we don't hear much about that. So. The media does report some very good things. There are some very good programs that are run on the drugs, but there are some that are, might actually not help the person who is struggling with help, leading to that person thinking twice about seeking assistance because they're going to be labeled. Okay. Uh, and we've got a question from Tanya. What could employers yeah. do if they suspect drug users at work with workers who use machinery? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. I think if you look at it that this is a risk to the individual and to others. So employers need to have um, protocols of, of very clear policies. We hear so many policies where there was not a very clear policy on how to address and support the individual as well. But the first question, the first part is to, to the level of risk to the individual and the level of risk to others. So. It is the duty of the employer to, um, to have those clear guidelines and educate people 
on the risk that they're putting others at. So the employer and the employee will both have the duty to, to provide a safe working environment. So if the employee has not followed the guidelines that are clearly saying you should not be operating machinery under this, but at the same time, there is also the support that that employee might need. So some employers might put uh, measures in place such as first strike, second strike, or some employers may choose to say if you are found to be positive to drugs, you lose your job. But sometimes that might actually drive people things down under. Whereas if someone, if we can encourage a situation where people come up and say, I am struggling and I need help, and people know that they'll be assisted, there's a chance of people seeking help. It is a very, very good question and again, a very challenging one in many jobs. Okay, and we've got a comment here from, from Kim, who's asking, yes. suggesting, are you, are you agreeing that uh, there may be a level of impairment or influence by recreational users who may not, sorry, who may use on the weekend and not, not during the work week? Yes, there is, um, there is, again, depending on the drug. Um, so, for example, people get stopped by police while they're driving and they had been drinking the previous night, and they do test positive. So in the, in the situation of alcohol, someone is testing positive on a breathalyzer when they were drinking a few hours ago in the early hours of the morning and they drive to work. So the same can be said about drugs, and depending on some of the drugs, and depending on how much the person has used. So for example, talking of the two drugs that we looked at, the two main drugs that we looked at, methamphetamine, ice, Methamphetamine does stay in the body system for quite a while and the effect of that can go for days depending on how much the person has used. So it is likely that the person might be going to work if they have been using the previous day. So it might actually be that the person is going under the influence of this, uh, this drug. But again, it depends on the individual. People respond to drugs differently and how they've used the same way where people may be affected, may get intoxicated very quickly when they use alcohol if they haven't eaten. So the same way that if someone has been using drugs for a long time, their tolerance might be, but they, when they do get tested, they, they may be positive. So it, it, it depends on a number of factors. Uh, but yes, that's cool. a... that question is correct. Okay, so what about testing in the workplace? Can you give testing for drugs in the workplace. Can you give a little bit more insight into that process or any recommendations? Yes, it's, it's a subject that, um, that my colleagues, me and my colleagues were talking about just this week where there was, um, there was a situation that was in the paper. Testing um, does happen already in many jobs. Uh, in jobs where, so for example, I, I believe train drivers, I believe people who work in the mines, it is, um, it's got very good side to it in that if you look at it that if you're a train driver, you're driving a train that is packed with people and there are people who are, you're putting other people's lives at risk, including your own life. You're operating very big machinery that can cause problems. However, the other side of things is that um, this then drives people to use other drugs in the belief that they are not going to be detected. So, for example, the part of the drugs of um, uh, synth synthetic cannabis. So, people do use this drug on the belief that they will not be te they will test negative if they do provide a urine spe sample, because we probably don't have the um, the technology yet to test for these drugs in someone's urine or in someone's saliva. So. It's a very, it's a very good question. I don't have a very, I don't have a yes or a no answer to it um, for the reasons that there are benefits to it, but there are also other side to it that um, are very, very clear and obvious, and we we, we can debate it quite fairly. Mm -hmm. uh, another question for for you, Keith from Tanya, is uh, how can employers arrange to drug test their employees if they are suspecting an employee without making the rest of their employees feeling, well, sorry, without making that employee feel targeted? Would they need to test everybody at once? So I think this is then becomes a, a policy a policy issue within the organization. 
um, if you if one is going to test one individual and they are not testing everyone else, I think the individual might become very suspicious of this situation. And if I was, if it was me or if it was you, among all these people who are working within an organization, you just grab Keith and say, Keith, we're going to test you for drugs today. I think the, so the first part is making sure that the organization has got very clear guidelines and policies. So they can, one way to go around it is to say, as an organization, we do random drug testing. And then making sure that the, the legal side of that is watertight in that everyone is fully aware of the legal process, of the legal side where they stand. And the organization has consulted with their lawyers or with their corporate uh, side of things. So having a random test clears that. You, you as the employer, you can decide when that random test is going to occur. And if you know that the individual is on today, then you do a random test and you say, the random test is today. But it needs to be guided by policy within the, in, within the organization. And so Nick, Nick also has a question here for you, Keith, best, just basically asking if you think that workplace testing programs um, are helping to lo lower the use or, or reduction in abuse of drugs. Um, they may lower um, drug use, yes, uh, but people do use drugs. Sorry. Are you there? Yep, yes, Sorry. we are. Uh, so people do use drugs for many reasons, um, and people use drugs for self-medicating. So if someone is really down and they believe that a drug that they would like to use might help them with how they feel, so it is, there is the argument of a disease. So people who will try and find ways of going around that policy, as we can see, if we, when we started talking about the methamphetamine, at some point it was available on the, on the prescription in America. And when we made it illegal, people found a way of making that available to themselves because they needed it. So I don't have a very, I don't have an answer that I can say, yes, it causes, it, it reduces or it doesn't. But in the places where testing happens, so for example, prisons, prisons, prisoners are tested on a regular basis. Do we find drugs in prisons? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. I guess that sort of follows on to a question that Tai Chi has just listed for you, Keith, and that's if a workplace were to introduce drug and alcohol testing, testing should there be um, notice given in terms of bringing in that policy to give individuals a chance to seek help, or if so, what's a good amount of time um, to give people notice that the policies are, bring in, are brought into the workplace? Uh, I wouldn't know um, exactly how much notice people need to have. I think every policy would need to follow the protocol of that organization. But in terms of bringing a, uh, bringing in a policy and saying to people, we need to test people. The goal in any situation is to reduce harm and to also assist people. So if we, if our goal is to say we have produced a policy, we well, let's make it public to people that we've introduced a policy and we're going to be randomly testing people. And you hope that then these individuals who might be struggling are given that opportunity to say within the next few weeks before the policy becomes, um, in effect, then those people can actually approach the, those in charge and say, I'm actually struggling because I think when someone loses their job, it's always very difficult and it's always very painful because what are they going to do and what, how is their life going to do? They're probably going to use more or because they're feeling down. So any opportunity for someone seeking help is a great opportunity. Okay. And did we have any other last questions from anyone uh, still on, on the call? Okay. 
I think we're probably done with questions for now. Keith, thank you very much for your time today. It was an amazing presentation. I think we all got a lot out of it. Um, thank like you. Like I said, we will be sending out an email to all participants with a link to the recording so you can, can view the recording at a later time. Thanks for joining okay. us all today. And your feedback is greatly appreciated as well. And if we can get things to, you can discuss with Paul regarding um, if there's anything that we can improve as well. And apologies for the phone that rang a couple of times. I apologize for that. I don't know how, the, probably the people had direct line. I should, we should have disconnected this one directly. Apologies for that.